Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, it has been a long time since we've done the Bridge HC online, at least I'm thinking, what, three, four weeks? Um, and I wanted to take a moment before we get into our conversation tonight to thank all of you. Uh, uh, many of you know, if you know me personally, that my mom passed away earlier um, last month now, and uh, you know it's been uh, quite the hard few uh, few weeks to month, and you know, you've uh, you've all been praying for me and talking with me, texting me, checking up on me, uh, and I and I truly do appreciate that. Um, uh, if if you, if this is new knowledge to you, well, this is why we've been just downloading the content um, straight from our Zoom sessions uh, to the uh, to YouTube and why we skipped even last week. So I, I appreciate your patience um, as we've been trying to get back into a natural flow of things after dealing with the death and dealing with the things that happened after the death and dealing with family. So again, just wanted to say thank you not only for your past prayers, not only for your current prayers, but for your continued prayers all right um, let's uh, let's dive right in today we're starting a new series uh, that we are calling repurposed where we're talking about this idea of repurposing our faith to one that impacts our entire lives and today I want to talk about holistic faith now when you hear that word, you probably start thinking uh, about what the word holistic usually means in today's culture. And so you, you put this um, new age type of, you know, thought to it or, or you know, uh, ultra progressive Christianity or, you know, whatever, whatever thought comes into your head. I want you just to put that aside because today as we introduce this new series, I want to talk to you about what holistic faith is. Uh, how we are going to use it, uh, and how we're going to explain it over the next six uh, conversations, including this one. Okay, so uh, our our main text uh, that we're going to deal with today, um, and uh, that will be the kind of the foundational text for the entire series. We'll only deal with it today, but this will be the thing that guides us the rest of the series. Is found in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 10. Now, I, I, we're only going to go through a couple verses at a time, uh, but I'm going to just encourage you um, to, uh, to either uh, find this on your phone, find the, verse, uh, the verses on your phone, and, and look at them, because we're going to be studying a couple of words uh, at a time throughout each of these texts so that we can better understand the original meaning of, of certain words. Now, I am not a Hebrew scholar. I don't pretend to be. Uh, I don't want to be. That's a very, very hard job for a lot, for people who are way more intelligent than I am. Uh, but based on the studies that I've done and the commentaries that I've read, I'm going to give a, an educated guess as to these words that, that we are using. And, and if there are disagreements, that's great. You can bring those up to me via uh, social media or email. We'll get to that later on. But I want to uh, I want to start just by reading the first couple of verses of Jeremiah 17, uh, verses five to six, and I want to dive right into uh, what uh, the problem that is caused that creates the need, I think, for uh, holistic faith. So let's take a look. Jeremiah 17, starting in verse five. Here's what uh, Jeremiah writes. It's a prophecy of the Lord. He goes, "Thus says the Lord: Cursed is the man who trusts in man." And makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the dark, uh, excuse me, the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Now, if we're going to take a look at and fully understand a, a holistic faith uh, and what we want to talk about, we also have to understand what Jeremiah is getting at. And these uh, these two verses. So I want to take a look at just a few words. First one there is the word cursed. What does the word cursed mean? We use it a lot in society. Uh, you know, a lot of churches uh, will use this word, especially if they come from traditional contexts, right? But do we really know what the word means? Well, the word cursed 
uh, according to my studies, means to ban or to set aside for destruction. Now, I want you to keep that second definition in your head. We're going to talk about that in more detail in a different section. Set aside for destruction. Okay. Now, I, as I was reading these uh, different commentaries and different things, the word that kept on sticking out to me was the word abandon. And I think that's a pretty good word for, uh, for the context in which Jeremiah writes chapter 17. That to be cursed in this context means to be abandoned. All right. Now let's let's move on to a different word because I want to I want to give a full context of these verses. Trust then. What does the word trust mean? Well, trust means to put confidence in. All right. Uh, flesh. The word flesh there in verse five is the physical self. Okay, that's something that a lot of Christians probably already know. But if you're not a Christian or you're not churched or if you're just not educated in this, that's what we're talking about when we use the word flesh. It means physical self. Okay. Heart. Heart means spiritual, spiritual self, the core of a person. So there's this um, difference between the flesh of a person, which is their physical self, and the heart of a person, which is the core of who they are, their spiritual self. Okay, uh, Together they make the whole person, but they're very different aspects of who a person uh, is. All right, uh, Turns away. That is it means to reject, uh, to depart, to leave. Okay? Uh, we usually talk about this when we sin, we turn away from God, all right? Uh, we reject God, all right? That's the, that's the same kind of context there. In other words, it's another way of saying abandon. So when we look at verse 5, a, a different way of maybe saying verse 5 is this. Abandoned is the person who puts confidence in themselves and spiritually abandons God. All right. So when we're talking about cursed here, we're really talking about uh, a person who is who causes themselves to be abandoned by abandoning God. All right. Now, verse six. Then there's just a few more words that I want to that I want to look at. That word shrub. What is the word? Sh what, what what is a shrub? What are we talking about here? All right. Now. You may know this. I know I didn't. Uh, and then uh, I asked this last night at our actual worship service. Uh, what does, what is, did, did people know what the word, uh, or what, uh, what a shrub actually is defined by? And they said no. But a, a shrub here in this context is a, a type of juniper that has shallow roots that will not reach to the water source underneath the ground. Okay, that's important here. All right. Uh, it is. It has a stark and naked appearance, and, and it has no prospect of improvement since it has what is known as stunted roots that cannot get to the water levels. Right. So it, it's a. It's a pretty much a lifeless plant, a lifeless plant that that will have no improvement. All right. And this shrub, according to verse six, lives in a parched wilderness, uh, in a salt land. Well. If you look at that second part in this parched places of the wilderness and an uninhabited salt land, this is just uh, Jeremiah saying that a person who does not trust the Lord, who is cursed, is in a, uh, in a land that is filled with death about three times over. Okay, So a parched land, that's a hot, lifeless desert. Okay, The wilderness, in Jeremiah's context, is a desolate land that supports little to no life. And then a salt land has no possibility of life, okay? Think about the Dead Sea. That's a, that's a salt type of sea, right? There's no life in it whatsoever. The salt, uh, the salt land is basically the same thing. So what are we saying here in verse 6? Well, people of abandon have no chance of success. They, they cannot better themselves, nor can they ever leave their current situation. They will live as if they have no life, nor do they have any life support. There is no hope for them at all. This is why when we're talking about the problem of, uh, of Jeremiah 17, the problem that creates the need 
for a, a holistic life, we have to talk about people of abandon. Because that's what we are without God. We are people of abandon. People who think that we can better ourselves by fixing ourselves. And if we think we can better our lives on our own, we will not only be sadly mistaken, we will end up living as if we have no life at all. People who live in addiction know this all too well. They, they, they think they can, they can fix their own addiction. They think they can fix their own lives. They think they can, they can get themselves out of this rut that they find themselves in. But the harder that they try, the worse that it becomes. And to live this way, not even just in addiction, but in any way that, uh, that trusts in ourselves instead of God, is to abandon not only ourselves, not only those close to us, but to abandon God as well. Now, I, 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 I know, you know a lot of you who listen to this or who come to Tuesday nights and, and, and who maybe even know me personally, <laughs> you, you hear what I'm saying. You say, well, Larry, I'm not an addict. I don't, you know, I don't try to fix my own, my own, uh, my own spiritual issues. You know, I, this doesn't apply to me. Well, let me ask you this. Are you a problem fixer? Are, are you a do-it-yourselfer? Like I am, right? I, I'm the type of guy who whenever uh, something breaks or something goes wrong in my life or when a relationship goes wrong, I do whatever I can, emphasis on the word I, to fix a problem. I run head first into an issue because I want to find a solution. I don't like things to uh, uh, to boil up. I don't like things to simmer. I don't like things to, to get worse. So I think if I don't fix this now, it's not going to get fixed at all. And what happens, and, and maybe you're like this, maybe you understand. What happens is that the, the more I try to fix it, the worse it becomes. Like, have you ever tried to fix uh, a problem on your phone or uh, you ever try to fix a, a project at home and, and, and you're just really stuck on it and you try to, you try to you know, get in your head and you try to get logical about it. But you, if you ever found that like, the, worse, the more that you, that you uh, get lost in your project, especially when a problem comes up, the worse that that problem becomes. That's, this is what I'm talking about here. When, when there's an issue in life and we run head first into this issue without God, the problem often gets worse. And, and it may not be something as serious as addiction. It could be something as small as an argument with your spouse uh, or you know, a bill issue, right? When we start doing these things without God's involvement, we start feeling the heat of the desert. We start feeling parched. We start feeling thirsty. And if we never leave, if we get so caught in our stubbornness and our pride that we won't allow uh, ourselves to ask God for help, then eventually we become like the cursed person. We become like the people of abandon that Jeremiah talks about in chapter, in chapter 17, verse 5 and 6. We become people of abandon. This is the problem that I want you to think about as we head into our first set of discussion questions that are coming up on the screen here in just a moment. If this is your first time with us, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here. Here's what's about to happen. Questions are about to pop up on the screen. You're going to pause the video and you're going to, uh, you're, you're going to either talk about this with your group, which I hope you have formed, that there, are at least, that there is at least one other person with you to discuss these questions in detail. Or if you're by yourself, no worries. Take some time to quietly reflect and, and, and write down some of your thoughts to these questions that you have or any question that you might have over the things that have been said thus far, okay? Take about 10 to 15 minutes to do that, and when you're done, come on back, hit play, and then magically, uh, through the power of the interwebs, uh, I will come back on and we will start our second section.
Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, I hope you had a really good conversation. Let's quickly rehash uh, the main point uh, that we just discussed, okay? People of abandon constantly leave God, okay? That's what Jeremiah was, calling, that's who Jeremiah was calling out there in verses five and six. People of abandon who constantly leave God out of their issues. And when they do that, it leads to desolate lives with absolutely no hope of help, okay? Uh, our world is one of do-it-yourselfers who, who would rather rely on our own power to fix things than God, right? And, and you might be, you know, you know, sitting there and thinking like, you know, Larry, yeah, I mean, our world does a pretty good job of fixing things. Really? Because I would say that we've done a pretty bad job, okay? Now, I, I, I don't buy into these things, but... Uh, it made the news, so it's worth discussing. A couple days ago, uh, a bunch of scientists came together uh, and said that the doomsday clock, I don't know if you know what this is, but uh, the doomsday clock uh, is this clock that, that pretty much uh, counts down to the destruction of humankind, okay, or the destruction of our world. And they take into account climate change and, you know, people and, you know, conflicts and things like that. And for the last, I think, year or so, uh, it has been at 100 seconds until about two, two or three days ago as of this recording where it got moved to 90 seconds to midnight, okay? Uh, 10 second, seconds closer. The reason why? The threat of nuclear war from Russia, all right? So, <clears throat> you know, we live in this world that says, oh, science can fix everything. Well, sometimes science can screw us up. And I love science, right? But the mere fact that there is an even idea of nuclear war says that, you know, even with something as as decent and good as science, we can still screw things up. So if, if people of abandon have no hope and no help, and we live in a world that, thrives full of people of abandon what's the solution well the solution is found i think in verses seven and eight let's take a look jeremiah says this blessed is the man who trusts in the lord whose trust is the lord that's a highlightable verse in my book um, so highlight that if you want Verse 8, he is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Now, what are we getting out of these, out of these two verses? Well, just like we did last time, I want to just throw up a couple of words. Actually, I wanted to find one word, okay? The word blessed. What does the word blessed mean? When we talk about what the word cursed means, what does the word blessed mean? Well, blessed means to be set apart. Now, remember, I told you to, to put in your head the word cursed means to set aside. I'm going to ask you to do the same thing for the word blessed. All right. The, the word blessed means not to set aside, but to set apart. Now, we're going to talk about those differences here in just a moment. But blessed means to be set apart for holiness. Be set apart for holiness. And we only know what the word trust means, but it bears repeating. It means to put confidence in. So verse 7, restated, means that a person, uh, the person who not only trusts in the Lord, but puts all confidence in him, will be made holy. The person who trusts in the Lord, who puts everything they have, key word there, Everything they have in him will be made holy. Now we're going to connect that to our holistic faith here in the next section. But I want you to remember this, that when we're trusting in the Lord, we're putting everything that we have in God. And when we do that, we will be made holy. He reiterates this in verse 8. He says, uh, the person who puts all their eggs in God's basket, right, is someone who will always have nourishment. This is what he means when he talks about like a tree planted by water. They will have no worry of death because they will always have life within. Why? Because they'll be connected to this water source. But here's, here's a great 
a great part of it. I love how uh, verse 8 is wrapped up. This life will be evident not only to their own minds and souls, but to those around them as well. Because fruit does not exist for the betterment of the tree itself. Fruit exists for the betterment of those externally. For those that pick the fruit and eat it. But for also the seeds that fall from it and are planted and, uh, and sprout up new trees to continue the, uh, the health and life of the environment around it. You know, it's interesting to me that both blessings and curses of God are things that separate us, although in, in, in very different ways. Curses set us, set us aside for destruction, but blessings set us apart for holiness. And I don't know about you, but when I hear these two terms, I get very two very different images, okay? Uh, like I said at the very beginning of our time together tonight, you know, my mom passed away about three or four weeks ago now, and uh, um, when uh, after she passed, we spent some time, my, my uh, sister and brother uh, spent some time just going through all the pictures so that we could have them for the funeral, and and, and, and it's funny, like if you've ever gone through this process, you know, you know that there are, are tons of photos that you go through that are like, yeah, no, there is no way we're, we're keeping these or anybody wants to see these. So, you know, you kind of, what, you toss them aside, right? Uh, you, set us, you set them aside, right? You toss them aside because that because you know that you're going to get rid of those pictures. No one's going to ever want to see those. You know, you know my, my dad had tons of pictures of just cars, right? And, and so we were like, okay, you know, we're not keeping those. And, but when you got to the ones that really mattered, the ones that, that included, you know, your loved one, and the ones that included happy memories, even if you're not the one who found it, you know when something happens because, because the person going through it, they, 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 like time freezes for them. Their, their breathing kind of slows. Their talking stops. And, and, and they just stare. And you know when that happens, they found something good. And what do we usually do? We carefully set it apart from the rest of the pile. And we say, this one, this one's a special one. This one is for later. This is what, this is the difference between a cursing, or a cursing, a curse and a blessing. When we are people of abandon, we are set aside. We, we toss our, you know, we toss ourselves aside as if our faith doesn't matter, our life doesn't matter, and we're set aside for destruction, for the garbage bin. But those who are blessed are carefully placed apart, set apart for something different. There's value there. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed and not cursed. And the only thing that separates the two here is with whom we connect. This is why instead of being a person of abandon, we're calling this section people of connection. Because if we are going to be blessed, we have to be connected. Those who are cursed, those who are tossed aside for destruction connect to themselves which really means they connect to nothing while those who are blessed connect to God and this is shown in the symbolism of the cursed shrub and the blessed tree the shrub connects to nothing it's the shallow roots aren't able to connect to any water source, but the blessed tree has roots that go so deep that they uh, that they reside in the water source itself, and therefore have no worries. This is where we want to be. That water source is 
is metaphorically and symbolically uh, God, right? All right, uh, think about John chapter 4, where Jesus uh, talks to the widow, uh, the widow at the well, right? Uh, or the woman at the well, I mean, not the widow, the woman at the well. Where, uh, where he says that if you drink from the water that I offer you, you will never thirst again. I am the living water, right? God is that living water. So if we connect ourselves to God, we will always have life. This is where we want to be. And we do this by putting all that we have, everything that we have, into our relationship with God. To always have life within us means that we will have... Uh, that we will always have life within us no matter what issues we are facing. Now, this is important because if you look at the verses, it says that even in a drought, which means that we will still experience drought. The verses that we just read says that even when life gets horrible, it will still get horrible. But the difference is, is that we will still flourish. We will still, we will still have fruit regardless of the external forces coming at us. So not only will we have life within us, but no matter what happens in life, if we are connected with God, people will take notice. We want to be people of connection. And I want you to think about that as we head into our second set of discussion questions. You're going to pop up here in just a second. Go ahead and hit pause. Take 10 to 15 minutes. And we will come back and uh, enter into our third and final conversation. Hey guys, welcome back. Now let's quickly rehash what we talked about in this last section. The opposite of abandoned is connection. You know, we want to be people of connection. God wants us to be people of connection, not people of abandon. But that can only come when we put all we have into God. You know, it's funny. Uh, I've been a Christian now for a long time. Uh, I've been a Christian for, what, 22 years. That's when I really st start taking my faith seriously. I mean, I was baptized 20, what, 26 years ago. But, you know, I was a teenager and stupid, right? So I didn't really get serious with my faith until later on in my teenage life. And, and, and I'm glad that I did because when I did... I was able to truly find my tribe. You know, the people in my life who I count on uh, when things get rough. And, you know, Heather and I, my wife and I, were talking about this just a couple days ago that, uh, you know, the last five years uh, have been really rough for us, both as individuals, as a married couple, uh, but also as a family. Like, there's just been so many things things that have been going on with us and that have been impacting not only us, but those that we care about and those that we love truly, you know, but it's been, um, it's been tolerable because not only of our faith, not, not just because God has been there with us, but because God has given us people in our lives who have been there for us. And, and this is this is this is what happens when you become a person of connection. When you become a person of connection, you really start understanding that God will get you through the toughest times, right? You know, it, it, that there's this preacher adage that says, "If he gets you to it, he'll bring you through it," and and, and that is so true. So this is what we need to do. This is who we need to be. Then how do we do it? How do I put all that I have into God? Well, this is what we're going to talk about uh, through our last two verses tonight. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. Here's what is written. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of of his deeds. Now quickly, I want to go through some words here just so we completely understand what's going on. That word deceitful in verse 9 means to be tripped up. And not just 
tripped up. Not like someone's, you know, uh, standing in front of you, sticking their leg out, right? No, to be uh, deceitful means to be tripped up from behind and it actually means to be tripped up by the heel. So it's, uh, it's like a sweep the leg attack from behind, right? It, it means that like out of nowhere, you just lose your footing because you lose your stability. And it was caused by somebody else. Now, desperately sick then means to have something incurable. Not, not just, you know, I have a cold. <coughs> no, it means I have stage four cancer. And there's no hope for me. So in other words, what verse nine is telling us is that because of our natural tendencies, we are constantly being tricked to go against God, either by someone else or even by our own selves. And unfortunately, there is no way to fix this. Our world, our society, our culture, even ourselves, we are incurable when left to our own devices. And this is why verse 9 ends in this hopelessness, this cry out, who, who can understand what is going on with the human heart? And like a savior, like the savior, God says, now I am the one, I got this, who searches the heart. Now that, that word search is not just, you know, casually looking for something like, uh, like I do when my wife asks me to look for anything. You know, it's, uh, it, it's to probe, to, to tear everything apart and to search every corner, every nook and cranny of our heart. And to test then the mind. And it's funny because that word test also means to search. It means to probe. It's, a, it's the same kind of word, but just a different nuance of it. Because in, in this one, it has this connotation according to the studies that I read and the commentators that I read that it means to probe for genuineness. So really what's going on here in verse 10 is that God comes down and says, look, I'm here. I will examine the heart and I will examine the mind for genuineness and I will give anyone what they deserve based upon their fruit. So if we're talking about not becoming people of abandon and instead becoming people of connection, in order to do that, we have to be genuine. And to be genuine, we have to be people of submission. There's nothing we can do to be connected to God except to submit ourselves to God. That's it. Christianity is as simple as saying, I give everything that I have to you. Because when we allow him the opportunity, when we allow God the opportunity to connect. He will search in, in, in us and find that we are people of connection and not abandoned. Not that we are people of perfection, but we are people of connection. So I have to ask, what do, what do we do to submit then? Do we just, you know, uh, pull a Michael Scott from the office and say, I declare bankruptcy, I declare submission? Yes, but no. If we take a look at the hints that Jeremiah has given us throughout uh, Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10, we will see what it means to submit to God. It means giving up every aspect of our lives. It means giving up our physical life. The connected person does not rely on themselves. To submit to God means giving up our mental life. The connected person has a genuine and proven belief in God. To submit to God means giving up our emotional life. The connected person has no faith-crushing, soul-crushing anxiety or fear when problems arise. This coming from a person who deals with anxiety on a regular basis. A person who submits to God gives up their relational life. 
The connected person always has healthy fruit for others to enjoy. And then finally, the connected person gives up their spiritual life. The connected person is connected to Jesus, the living water who guarantees that we will never thirst again. Folks, this is what I call holistic faith. It's a faith that puts every aspect of life into the hands of God. It puts our physical life, our mental life, our emotional life, our relational life, and our spiritual life into the hands of God. And this is what repurpose the uh, conversation series that we're entering into this week will cover each week after today. We'll talk about what does it mean to give up our physical life? What does it mean to have a faith that is impacted physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, and spiritually? Now, this is what I want you to think about as we head into our last set of conversation questions. They're going to be put up here to the screen in just a moment. Go ahead and push pause. When you're done, hit play, and I will finish things up. People of connection submit to God. It's funny because in just a few verses later, uh, in verse 14 of Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah prays this. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. For you are my prayer. You know, after all that he said, he understood that the only way to be healed, the only way to be saved is to stop relying on himself, to start relying on God, to not be a person of abandon, but to be a person of connection, but not just spiritually. Everything that made Jeremiah who he was, his physical life, his mental life, his emotional life, his relational life, and his spiritual life, the things that define him had to be connected as well. They had to be plugged in as well. And that leads me to the one thing that I want you to remember, the one thing that I want you to focus on. Plug in to connect. Plug in to connect. If we want this to be true of us, if we want to be people of connection, if we want to be healed when life beats us down, if we want to be saved when we find ourselves in a physical, mental, emotional, relational, or spiritual desert, then everything that we have, every aspect of our lives needs to be plugged into God so that we can be connected to God. Our physical life, we need to plug it in. Our mental life, we need to plug it in. Our emotional life, we need to plug it in. Our relational and spiritual life, guess what? We need to plug them in. Because if they're not, if even one thing is left set aside, instead of set apart, then we're going to feel the heat of that desert and we're going to start feeling ourselves becoming more and more parched until one day we wake up and we realize that our roots have become shallow, our mouths have become dried, and there is no more life support for us to have. We will find ourselves to be people of abandon. And we don't want that. We want to be people of connection. So if you're sitting here and you're asking yourself, I want this. I want to be able to plug in every aspect of my life. And and I I, I just want to talk about this with someone. Reach out to us, please. We are here. You can connect to us via social media. You can find us on Facebook or Instagram. You can, uh, you can go to our website, thebridgehc.org. You can contact us there. You can message us on our socials. You can even email me. It's all there on the screen. If you want to connect, we are willing to connect. And it doesn't even have to be uh, you know, through the internet. We would love to meet with you in person. I, as a pastor, would love to meet with you in person. 
So please connect with me and let's start talking and let's start connecting and let's start working through this one-on-one. -on -one. But let me tell you the best way that you can um, that you can connect with us on a very personal level and a, and a, and a holistic level is by joining us each and every Tuesday night, becoming part of the community that is known as the Bridge Church of Hendricks County. We meet each and every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. at Tri-West Middle School in Lisbon, Indiana. And let me tell you, it is a great time full of, uh, of conversation. We ask these questions each and every week um, that apply to the conversation that we're, that we're having that night. We have worship, we have prayer, communion, we would love for you to join us. Join us at 6.30 each and every Tuesday night and get to know us in person. And if you're, not, if you're not able to come in person, join us online. You can go to online.thebridgehc.org. We have Zoom conversations live each and every Tuesday night. Uh, we don't start that until about 6.45 uh, because uh, of licensing. We can't do the worship live. But we can do we do the conversations live and we have one of our leaders uh join in on those conversations and lead the conversations so join us via zoom on tuesdays as well all right guys that will do it for me today i hope you can join us next week when we talk about our physical faith uh but until then as always peace love and soul mm -hmm.